master, a boy scout, and a computer expert were the only passengers on the small plane. The pilot came back to the cabin and said that the plane was going down, but there were only three parachutes and four people. The pilot added, I should have one of the parachutes because I have a wife and three small children. So he took one and jumped. The computer whiz said, I should have one of the parachutes because I am the smartest man in the world and everyone needs me. So he took one and jumped. The pastor turned to the Boy Scout and with a sad smile said, You are young and I have lived a rich life, so you take the remaining parachute and I'll go down with the plane. The Boy Scout said, Relax, Reverend, the smartest man in the world just picked up my knapsack and jumped out. <laughs> and there he goes, jumping to a conclusion. I can relate to that fellow, you know. I enjoy computers. I did well in school, but yes, I've also made colossal goose. I can find myself in that story when I've been proud of my smarts and made hasty judgments. Bar 16, 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Sometimes pride gets the better of us. We think we're the cat's whiskers, but a fall awaits those who are self-blinded by conceit. Jesus tells a story in Luke 15 of a father with two sons in which many people can find themselves, relating to one of the two boys. The older son was proud. The younger was a prodigal, wasteful, a big spender. Now many times when this story is told in church, the emphasis is on the younger son, a classic reprobate who blows his wad in immoral living. Yet when you look at the context in which Jesus told the story, Pharisees and teachers of the law muttering about him hanging out with tax collectors and sinners, Jesus' main thrust probably had more to do with the elder son. That makes us uncomfortable. Is he really implicating us in this story? We are, after all, in church like we're supposed to be. We're not at home sleeping in, hung over from some debauched party Saturday night. Especially today, we should get extra credit. The clock sprang back and sprang ahead last night, making this seem extra early. It was dark this morning when I got up. We are the ones who dragged ourselves out of bed, took time to make ourselves presentable, reminded and challenged and yelled and cajoled and tussled with the kids to get changed and out to the car and here on time. Is Jesus really going to tell a story that makes us look perhaps as bad as the lazy partying layabouts that aren't even here? That couldn't get it together enough to show up this morning? Hmm. Prepare to squirm a bit, but hang on to your seats and don't jump. Let's consider first the younger son. He undergoes, through his experience, a dramatic transformation in three ways, from callous to contrite, from needy to nobility, and from rich to relational. First, from callous to contrite. Verse 12. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. This was totally inappropriate. Usual etiquette would be to wait for your father's death for your share of the estate. In some circumstances, a father might divide the inheritance technically, but retain the income from it until his death. But to do what happens here, give a son his portion of the inheritance upon request, was highly irregular. It carries the unspoken sentiment, I wish you were dead. Life Application Bible describes the son as having arrogant disregard for his father's authority. Well, you know the story, it doesn't last. Callous lad gets his things together, liquidates his holdings into portable cash, heads to a far country, and there blows the wad in wild, dissolute, unsafe, risky living. The word squandered in NIV translates a Greek term meaning scattered, as if he's throwing away fistfuls of cash. It's the same word that was used for winnowing, where you throw the grain up in the air and the chaff just blows away. When it's all gone, it so happens a severe famine hits the country. 
kind of like oil prices dropping in Alberta, I suppose. Factors beyond one's control. And our playboy starts to get tattered and hungry. Not to mention an annoying itch that won't go away. I'm just guessing. He attaches himself to a landholder who sends him out to the back 40 to feed pigs. Remember, to Jews, pigs are unclean animals, not even to be touched, but only eaten. And here he has to look after them. He's sunk below the pale in terms of common Jewish respectability. Physically, he's so starved that even the carob pods in the pig's slop start to look appetizing. You know you've got to be pretty hungry for that to happen. Suddenly, one stark, lucid moment out there in the remote field amongst the grunts and squeals, the switch flips for a turnaround Tom. A light goes on in the back of his mind, and he comes to himself. Verses 17 to 19. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. He was so callous, is now contrite. Note in particular two things in his rehearsed speech. I have sinned and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. This is repentance, contrition, admitting one's mistakes, being sorry you sinned, and realizing your unworthiness. You're no longer such hot stuff to cats me out. You've really royally blown it. You've sullied your parents' last name. You brought ruin not just on yourself, but you've dragged other lives down with you. You have no claim on anyone, no status to invoke as if deserving anything. All you can do is plead for mercy like a humble beggar. There is zero place for pride. He also goes from needy to nobility. In the faraway land, his clothes are muddy and tattered, feet are dirty and bare. When he arrives back home, what's his father call for? Verses 22, 23. The father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring a fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. The best robe, a long one that goes down to your feet like royalty wears, reserved for the guest of honor. Respectability in place of half-naked shame. A ring on his finger, that's a sign of power and authority used for seals and official documents. Sandals on his feet. Slaves went barefoot. Sandals marked the freeborn, a son of the Lord of the manor with dignity. Respectability, authority, dignity. In an instant, turnaround Tom has gone from needy to nobility, the cause for a huge celebration, a feast. And he goes from rich to relational. At the start, he has bags of cash. But when he returns home, when the father looks up and sees in the distance this half-clothed, grubby straggler bleeding and hobbling from the long journey on dirt roads, he has nothing, not a dime. Yet the next, next instant, Dad is falling on his neck, kissing and hugging and weeping for joy that the long-lost son is back home. It's as if the dead is alive and the father comes alive too. As the servant describes it to the older brother in verse 27, Your brother has come. Your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back, safe and sound. He's come. He's back, safe and sound. That's relationship. Isn't that worth more than riches, which can fly away so easily? The key to this whole miracle, of course, is the exceptional dad. Let's call him Herb Frank. He's so unusual as to be countercultural. We see a lot of God in Frank, just as we saw some of God in the sweeper woman finding her coin, and in the shepherd who searched out his lost sheep. Remember Jesus in Mark 10, 42, cautioning his disciples, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. 
Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your, what? Servant. Servant. If you take that out of the realm of government or management, and instead apply it to parenting, you'd end up with someone a lot like fervent Frank. For some dads, it's all about respect, authority, power, and control. Listen to me when I'm talking to you, boy. A Middle Eastern dad wouldn't divide up his property. That's unthinkable. A Middle Eastern dad wouldn't break into a run. That's not respectable. A power-conscious dad wouldn't leave a party to go plead with the son. What for? The son should come to him and submit to his authority. His children owe him that much and more. But over and over again, the dad in Jesus' parable is different, iconoclastic, shattering expectations all over the place. His giving, verse 12, he divided his property between them, without so much as a protest. He's gushing, verse 20. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son and, what? said, what's that smell? Pity! No. You tell me, grew up under your heart. Threw his arms around him and kissed him. The sense of the verb is kissed him again and again. This dad is lavish in affection. Filled with compassion. His innards stirred within him. Running toward his son. Not caring how undignified it looked. Positively gushy. Demonstrative. Romans 5.8 But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I'm glad we have a demonstrative Heavenly Father. God pulled out all the stops for you. The Father is gracious. Cut short the Son's carefully prepared apology in verse 21. Doesn't even let him get to the make me like one of your hired men part. So eager is he to get the Son suited up in the best robe and ring and sandals to show he's fully accepted again. Reinstated with the rights and relations of sonship just as if he'd never strayed in the first place. This meaning of to be justified. Just as if I'd never sinned. Ephesians 2, 4 to 8. But, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. This is you he's talking about. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by, what? Grace that you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. The Father is gracious. Fervent Frank is gentle. He's humble, lowly. Forgets his stateliness as he runs to greet the younger son. Doesn't camp on protocol, but leaves the party to plead with the older son. Why plead when you have the right to just order someone around? But he's gentle, pleading, paracleting is the literal sense of the word, interceding on behalf of the sibling. He's also gladness driven. Verse 32. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. We just had to. It was necessary, fitting that we be glad, literally rejoice. Like the shepherd and the woman earlier in the chapter calling their friends and neighbors to celebrate, rejoicing that the lost was found. Doesn't that sound like a good God to you? <clears throat> Mirrored in this earthly father who is giving gushy, gracious, gentle, and glad. But we haven't dealt yet with the character this story in context seems mostly about. The elder brother, proud, petulant Pete. 
Now, before we start lambasting him, let's give him some credit. He's the one who stuck around and managed the farm when his young whippersnapper brother absconded with a third of the estate and promptly blew it in the Big Apple. Think of George Bailey in It's a Wonderful Life, a character played by Jimmy Stewart. Always wanted to go traveling, but stayed home, managed affairs at the building that went loan while his brother got to go away and be more famous in adventures. The elder brother here did the right thing. He was the responsible one. Thanks to his hard work and careful management, Dad has been kept out of the poorhouse, despite allowing himself to be robbed blind early on by Turnaround Tom. But it's this very respectability, responsibility, self-righteousness, doing the right thing that keeps Pete out of the party. Not because it was wrong, but because he takes such pride in it and uses it to justify his existence. He's in a snip. Verse 28, the older brother became angry. Why so upset? Because dear old dad has received the wayward one as if he'd never done a thing wrong. Has dad forgotten how tough it was to manage when that third of the holdings just disappeared? Has it gone clean out of the father's mind what a slap in the face it was for Tom to demand his share even before Dad died? He's being snobby. Verse 28. The older brother refused to go in. Uh, what might he have been thinking? I'm not going to associate with a, this, such a scoundrel, such a low life, even if he is my brother. Why? He's a disgrace. He practically bankrupted us, leaving me here all by myself to look after an aging parent. He's probably infected with some venereal disease. I'm scared to even touch him. The very sight of that no good makes me sick. He is slanderous. <clears throat> Verse 30. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. He may be exaggerating here. Verse 13 talks about wild living, but didn't offer details. The elder brother may be a bit too quick to fill in the blanks and assume the worst about just where that missing money went. He is sneering. Listen carefully to the beginning of verse 30 again. But when this son of yours doesn't even call him my brother, Instead, slaps the father verbally by saying, This son of yours. You can almost hear the disdain and contempt. Forget brotherly love. I disowned this guy from our family. Worst of all, proud, petulant Pete is fundamentally selfish. A life that's wrapped up in itself makes a very small package. If this were a blog, there would be a little tweet this right after that. A life that's wrapped up in itself makes a very small package. Good quote, not original. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. He's so selfish, his perspective is entirely distorted. All these years, poor me overemphasizing the amount of time. Slaving for you. He's no slave. He's a son, the de facto manager of the estate. Never disobeyed. And that's questionable, unlikely given his obvious contempt for his father. No, it's commentator John MacArthur. You never even gave me a young goat. Did he ever ask? No. It's all about what he can do by his own effort. Ego prevents you from asking anyone for help. Pete's way of propping up his self-esteem is by doing everything himself, never daring to be vulnerable or risk rejection by asking anyone for anything. He can manage very well on his, all on his own. Thank you very much. That way, he gets the credit. And if you're as self-reliant and independent as me, 
this is where Jesus' parable starts to hurt, starts to hit home. I see myself in the older brother. Jesus has carefully framed the story in such a way that this is exactly where the Pharisees and teachers of the law from verse 2 find themselves. They are definitely the older brother, not the prodigal. They pride themselves on their law keeping, always doing the right thing according to the law of Moses, painstakingly observing the traditions of the elders, not like the partiers, the sinners, the prodigals. Life Application Bible notes, the Pharisees must have thought, we've sacrificed and done so much for God. Self-righteousness gets in the way of rejoicing when others come to Jesus. Now, when the parable's finished, who is left standing outside in the cold? The person who justifies himself. Who can only see how unfair is the Father's grace and acceptance of the wayward. As long as you're looking down your nose in contempt at someone else who's repentant, you can't find God's grace for yourself. As long as you're bent on earning your own brownie points and working your way to heaven by mastering religious rules, you'll never make it. It's so ironic. The elder son actually owns everything already. The father divided his property between them back in verse 12. But his self-focus is sabotaging any enjoyment of the actual benefits and privileges that are his. Never gave me even a young goat. Put that alongside the father's statement in verse 31. Everything I have is yours. He hardly even had to ask. But this metal wall of my works, my earning, my reward, locks him completely from the party. Any relishing of the father's grace. In a way, the father's estate is twice blown, twice wasted. The one-third that was the younger son's share has been squandered outright. But the two-thirds that is the older son's share isn't being accessed or enjoyed by that son either. But at least fervent Frank has the restored relationship with the younger son to enjoy. Even if nobody seems to be benefiting from real estate. A prominent Christian businessman, Howard Butt, wrote an article titled The Art of Being a Big Shot. If you're at all inclined to pride, to self-exaltation like the Pharisees, like proud, petulant Pete, like me, perhaps you can relate and repent before it's too late. Her businessman writes, It is my pride that makes me independent of God. It's appealing to me to feel that I am the master of my faith, that I run my own life call my own shots, go it alone. But that feeling is my basic dishonesty. I can't go it alone. I have to get help from other people, and I can't ultimately rely on myself. I'm dependent on God for my next breath. It is dishonest of me to pretend that I'm anything but a man, small, weak, limited. So living independent of God is self-delusion. It's not just a matter of pride being an unfortunate little trait and humility being an attractive little virtue. It's my inner psychological integrity that's at stake. When I'm conceited, I'm lying to myself about what I am. I'm pretending to be God, not man. My pride is the idolatrous worship of myself. And that is the national religion of hell. Let's pray.